All right, we're live. What is up, everybody? It's your man, your boy, your love interest. If you don't have one already, stereotypical Marquise here for another game. This is going to be a 5e one shot, and it is called A Red and Pleasant Fairy Tale. So let's get started. There's a mirror. On one side of that mirror is our world, or your world, or some other fantasy world that you have like to play these games in. On the other side of the mirror, Things are always different. They're weird, they're strange, but they're beautiful in their own right. In this world, across the mirror, we have a girl. Her name is Carolina. Sweet, red-headed Carolina. She likes to explore a lot, and Carolina is exploring right now. She is hopping and skipping and humming her way through a forest. Now, see, this forest is different than our own where our trees might have standard brownish or grayish colors for their bark. Some of these trees are white or silver or jade or gold or sapphire or just normal trees. And then when you see the leaves on these trees, much of them are the same colors. You have these indigos, these fuchsias, these blues, or just green for the most part. As Carolina is humming, the flowers are dancing. Now, when I say the flowers are dancing, I'm not saying they're bobbing in the wind or anything half as purpley poetic as that. No, the flowers are quite literally dancing around her. They like Carolina's songs and her hymns. They make her feel happy. Now, as Carolina is going through this forest, may I remind everyone watching, including the players, that the sky here is different too. You see, this is a red and pleasant fairy tale. And to be red and pleasant, the land too must be red and pleasant. And so look at the sky and imagine it. The sky is the color of fresh blood from a goat's neck when you slit it for sacrifice. It is a deep sanguine color and it does not change except at night when it becomes a deep abyssal black with neither star nor moon. And in the sky, we have a pigeon and the pigeon is flying in circles watching Caroline. As pigeons are wont to do, pigeons are very noisy, nosy, excuse me, as I'm sure everyone here would agree with. The pigeon is looking down and we see Carolina. We see her stopped at a door, a door in the middle of this forest, which is lying horizontally in the ground, basically built into the very earth of which it rests. She looks at that door and the lock on its doorknob and she takes out these odd things from her pockets, these lock-breaking tools she's stolen from the orb town she has come from. And humming and hemming to herself the entire time, she bends over and uses these tools to break the lock on the door, as is their purpose. They tell her not to do it. They remind her the elders said, no, this will be a mistake. And yet she does it anyway. And the door opens into the interior of this red and pleasant land. And down Carolina goes. We skip forward a day. We're in the town square. The elder is sitting on top of a pedestal. And she is smoking from this deep hookah. She has the body of a caterpillar with one of those gray white wigs that French noblemen used to love to wear back in the 1900s. And as it smokes from this hookah, before the caterpillar, before the elder, it's just a horde of maybe two to 300 people, all pissed off, none of them in a very good mood. Why are these people mad? Because Carolina has gone missing for the 17th time this year. As the crowd sits there, boiling angry, occasionally throwing rotten fruits at the elder, tell me what you're doing, Finnick Donskar. Finnick sits or stands just a few feet away from the end of the crowd, and he he kind of leans on one of his legs, kind of putting his weight on it. And he has this coin in his hand that he is kind of flipping in between his fingers and doing a bunch of uh, tricks. Sometimes he makes it disappear and reappear at the same time. And he's just watching with this, this smirk on his face. 
just watching and listening to the things that are going on. A small child, a child you know by the name of Gerald Fennick, um, is standing at the back of the crowd with you. Uh, Gerald looks up to you, and in his hand is a bag of coins that you know that, as Gerald is wont to do, he has basically cat pursed from everybody in the crowd that he could. He looks at you. He's a short boy, maybe nine years old, dirt on his face, throwing the coin of the, the bag of coins up and down in the air. And he looks to you and he says, "Why are you smiling for?" And at this, Finnick would just kind of crouch down a little bit so that he is at eye uh, eye level with uh, Gerald, and he'd just say. All of these people worried about one little girl. They don't hang on to their purses as you found that out. Sure don't. And then he, he waits for you to uh, do something, anything almost, um, expecting a trick as most kids expect from you, regardless of their, their reputations they may have. And he is going to kind of give this magic trick where he takes the coin and he makes it disappear. And then he he pulls from behind the ear, but it's not a coin. It is just this this small finch, yellow-breasted, and he kind of holds it out to show the boy this, like, smirk still on his face. The boy reaches into his bag. Um, he's giggling at the finch that you just pulled out. And he hands you a handful of silvers in exchange for the finch. And as he does so, the camera moves from you and back to the front of the crowd with the elder. The elder takes a deep drag from his hookah and then says in between breath of smoke, Now where is the wizard to solve this issue at? And he kind of leans his head back. And as he does so, more fruits are bouncing off of him. But the elder is completely just unfazed and unworried by this barrage of rotten stuff being thrown at him. Um, Yildrum, as you watch this happen, um, what do you do? Do you emerge before the crowd now? Do you wait and watch? What's going on with you? Yildrum is waiting and watching, um, looking on. He does not like to be called the wizard. He foretells future. He helps people with their problems. He has his own dealings to worry about. And the elder, unfazed, uninterested, is not really his type. Onlooking, Yildrim stands there waiting for something to happen, looking on and quite bemused at the almost riots that are unfolding. As you watch uh, Bemuse, Yojem, to use your own words, um, someone turns and looks at you. Now, are you dressed in your normal kind of like fortune teller garb, or are you dressed in something different today? No, heavily bedecked in jewelry and equipment of different kinds of knickknacks and um, bones woven into the hair. He's, I stand there with like some some cards in my hand, reading, uh, ready to read the fortune of whomever is unfortunate enough to come across me to lose all his money in the service. So one rioter does turn and look at you, Yo Jim, and they see you protect and jewelry with your cards are with your cards out, and they open their mouth and they look back up to the elder and they look back to you and they look back to the elder, they look back to you and they say, "Aren't you supposed to be?" Aren't you supposed to be up there with him, telling telling us that things are going to be okay? I, I just look at him and say, like, there is a forecast of rotten eggs and tomatoes on the stage. 
I had rather not be there at this very moment. When you say that, this rider looks down to his hands where he's like two rotten apples. And he looks back to you and he says, how, how did you know? A muse has told me. And I like my, my robes clean. When, <laughs> after you say that, the rider looks to his friend to his, to his side. Um, and he says exactly the last few words you said to them. And then that person nods and it's it to the next person. And it's like this game of telephone till it gets all the way back up to the elder. In which case, the elder's attendants, um, this young, almost teenage looking girl with blonde hair, has someone whisper into her ear. And then she whispers into the elder's ear. And the elder takes another hit from his hookah and he says, Ah, oh, I see. The wizard has told a fortune. He and two others will go rescue the girl to keep his robes clean, the elder says. And the fruits kind of stop. And people start looking back to you, Yuljum. What do you do? Cast invisibility. <laughs> so you disappear like that. Um, people are now even more confused than they were just a moment ago. And that's when we turn to you, Jenny. The camera turns over to you in this crowd. What have you been doing this entire time? I have been sitting relatively in the middle, but against the wall. And I'm sitting on a barrel with crossed legs. And I've been weaving back and forth, keeping an eye on everyone, just half smiling, half sad, and taking big drinks. I dig it. So someone close to you is uh, confused because they can't see deep into the crowd. They can't see what just happened with Yojum. But he turns to you, this um, older man, this gray beard. He has tattooed onto his forehead um, basically the four card symbols of like a standard playing deck. And he says to you, Jenny, well, Jenny, you're usually the one who handles all these issues, ain't you? You going to go handle this one, too? You know, maybe I will. And I stand on top of the barrel. I'll go. As you stand up and you announce that, um, at first, like 10% of the crowd hears you. They're too busy whispering, where the fuck did the wizard just go off to, right? And, but then it's like that game of telephone again, and it spreads this time back to you, Finnick. And then the child looks at you, as someone whispers from his ear, and he beckons for you to, like, to squat back down, Finnick. And he whispers in your ear and he says, Jenny knows where the girl is at. And he's going to go find her. She's going to go find her and beat her with the ladles. I, most of the people probably heard me because I was pretty open mm -hmm. about it. Finnick would just kind of roll his eyes. Jenny can't even find her own bar half the time. And, um, but he would kind of stand up and look over. And I think that a lot of people know him as someone who is, who just performs, but don't know a lot about him outside of that. And that's the way that Finnick likes it. But he kind of strolls casually over to you, Ginny, and he kind of puts this hand over on your shoulder. Well, you're probably gonna have to put it on my knee because I'm standing on a barrel. Oh yeah. <laughs> he just, yeah, he just kind of uh, puts it on the back of your, your calf and he just looks up at you. I'll go with you. Why oh. not? <laughs> I love a good joke on a dangerous journey. <laughs> You realize then, Finnick, that Jenny is incredibly drunk, as she usually is. Um, and as you realize that, people have forgot all about you, Yildrim. So, Yildrim, you hear that both Jenny and Finnick, two people of accomplished merit, as you know, are going to go find Carolina. Um, what are you going to do in the meantime, Yildrim? Um, them being at the other side of the crowd... I um, go and use this 
current distraction of the crowd to push myself onto the um the is it like a where's the, the elder standing on it's on like this uh not like a, a pillar like a, like a stage like a platform yeah okay so i move to the stage unseen and i just uh, stand next to the next to the one ear of this caterpillar elder and whisper into it and say like if i do this again you will owe me one more favor and he takes a drag from his hookah and he breathes out and the smoke moves around your invisible formula gym and he says by the time i've paid you back all your favors i'll be dead and so will my children so sure very well all right so at that um the elder announces again to the crowd, particularly to Finnick and Jenny, and unknowns to everyone else, Yildrim as well. Um, he announces this. She disappeared having opened the door to the way out. Go to the door? Please lock the door when you return so that no one else comes in through the way out. And then, as he says, it's the riding crowd, which has stopped riding now because of Eugenie. Um, they kind of go silent, and they nod at him. So it's like, okay, this is all right. We like Jenny. We like Finnick. They're kind of okay. And they begin to disperse slowly. So Finnick and Jenny and Yildrim, you're still invisible. What are you three going to do now? You know where the way out is. It's that door that I mentioned at the beginning of the game. Um, it's a little ways outside of his orb town, flat on the ground. So what do you guys want to do? You know, head straight there or so I, I would head there right away and start to kind of deal out some cards in front of it waiting for the others uh yeah i would uh i would roll fall forward and tumble without spilling a single drop of my drink and stumble on towards the hole Finnick would take advantage of the crowd that is still dispersing, dispersing, but, you know, they're still kind of milling about and he would just make his way through them. And if there happens to be a piece of gold or two that falls into his hands. As is usual, Finnick, um, <laughs> these people give out gold like a cornfield is out corn, right? So you're moving through them and you're, you, your pockets are full by the time everyone's kind of dispersed. Um, while the kid can still silver, you can still much more than that. So that being said, I assume you follow Jenny afterwards? Yeah, yeah, he right. would go after Jenny. So you're fanning your cards out, you old drummer. Are you still invisible? Um, nope, since I'm waiting for them and kind of needs to be be able to speak to them, and that is usually yeah. a lot easier if they see you. <laughs> usually. <laughs> Usually. Usually. Um, and maybe they would try to whatever, like find me or what. Um, I don't know. I, so. I would attempt to sneak up on the wizard. All right. Um, Yildjum, are you the type to be snuck up on? Sure. All right. So you sneak up on him, Jenny. What do you do? I tap him on the back and make a ha <sighs> noise to make him jump. And I say, hidden dragon. Strike snake. <laughs> How do you respond to this drunken woman, <laughs> Yojum? The town drunk, basically. All right. I. In shock for a second, kind of turn around and say, I did not expect what you said, although I smelled you for the last five minutes. Ah, good sniffer. And I boop him on his nose. I say, it has nothing to do with my nose, more with your fragrance of choice. Are, <laughs> are you trying to flirt with me? What? No. <laughs> but if you want to wish to know who, you, who would want to flirt with you, we can, I have a bargain to offer to you. <laughs> You're going to wizen me, a friend. <laughs> I have many friends in many places. <laughs> As she drunkenly rambles to herself, Finnick, what are you doing? Finnick is just kind of watching this, just kind of like just 
with this in almost indifferent look um and he would um go up to uh Yildrim and say ah it's a pleasure for us to finally meet i've heard you are almost as successful as i am at parting people with their 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 goods oh yeah. not, not me i just uh, pick up whatever they leave behind is all it's not like i take things from them but they just leave it and i, I take it up it's, it's nothing else. <sighs> well i've tried to stay here with these people and don't get their ire and I make them come back to me, which is, well, makes things easier. But let me finish this drawing of the cards, eh? Maybe we be home before dinner. And at that, Finnick, Finnick would just, like, kneel down right beside you. You'll have to show me these tricks sometimes. I would teach you mine, but, uh, and he just kind of taps him on the shoulder. Not sure that, uh, your bones or your old age could take it. Um, well, we'll see about that, eh? When it comes to it. So what I actually do, um, is I try to scry. And I will try to scry and see where Carolina is right now. Perfect. Um, is there a check with scrying on there? Just to refresh my memory. Yeah, there is. Um, it depends a little bit. So um, the thing is how familiar I am with her. So from the background, from, from what you told, it kind of made sense to me that I would want to search for her because of her inquisitive mind, because I know <laughs> she's going to find something in the future that will be important. Perfect. I like it. So, so uh, I was thinking that I'm at least like familiar with her. Otherwise, um, if we have access to a hairbrush or something, maybe. Right. So I don't know if if I would have like an implement of her of something that would make it even even uh, more accurate. Right? You guys kind of just like headed to, like straight here after the town. So I'm going to say you won't have an implement, but um, you are familiar with her. I'll say that. You'll okay. Yeah. So um, this is really up to you. So generally speaking. You can see and hear a particular creature you choose, which is her, uh, that is on the same plane of existence. Now, I don't know if how you want to work. <laughs> so I guess my character would know, though. So do I need to go through the door first before I do this? Or does this make sense at all? I you mean, know, it, it makes sense to scry somebody um, when you're across the mirror. That being said, so you do do your scrying spell um, from your cards. The information you're gonna get from your cards, you can tell me how like you kind of like interpret this, right? Mm -hmm. Is that you see the girl, you hear the girl, which means she's alive, which is good. It means nothing's got her yet, and she hasn't been turned to stone or like a toy or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, what you see, or what you think that you see, is you see a chessboard where all the pieces are stone, and where she's pretending to be one of the pieces. Mm -hmm. But she is not stone, she is still alive. Yes, she's still alive. And she's just standing there waiting, apparently, or frozen? Or rather, or... what I should say is she's breathing, but she looks like she is stone. So, like, paralyzed? Perhaps. Kind of, yeah. Perhaps. Mm -hmm. Okay. And kind of, I kind of put one one card down, and it's the tower, and I say, mm, and another card down, and it's the crow, and I look very, very, like, oh, this is interesting, right? <laughs> Doing the whole spiel. And at the end, I say, I, I just nod and say, well... I don't know exactly where she is, but who knows in these kinds of lands, eh? But I do know that she is still alive, and she is in a match of sorts, with her fate and ours in the balance. A match? Is she in a matchbox? Perhaps. You don't ever know. But I see she is in royal escort. And knights at her side. 
Take a point of inspiration, Simon, for doing your best to avoid saying the word chess match. <laughs> Talk like a true fortune teller. Indeed. <laughs> All right. And with that, I, uh, I'd i say, well, it appears we will need to venture into the beyond once again for this little girl. Mm -hmm. So I'll take you, you guys head to the door then. All right, so you guys go through the way out. As you go through the door, you go down these steps, essentially, or rather up the steps, because the moment you're actually through the door, you're walking up steps and not down steps anymore. Now, imagine one of those rooms or kind of like settings where there's doors and steps everywhere on random geometrical surfaces that makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. And that's where you guys are. Everything's either black or red. It's painted in a box, like a, like a checkerboard-like pattern. And there are just stairs and doors everywhere. You know that these doors and these stairs will take you to different parts of the place across the mirror, usually underground, sometimes above ground, sometimes someone's castle, sometimes someone's tomb, sometimes a matchbox, as Jenny herself described. That being said, this is where you guys are now. You're in the way out itself. Are you, how do you guys want to proceed? Do we know if this is like random that the doors lead to, or is there like a... There's a pattern to it, but the pattern likes to change itself a lot, but there's a pattern nonetheless. Um, if you've explored a lot outside of your orb town, then you know that basically sometimes you got to check maybe two or three doors to get a sense of that pattern to figure out where you're going. Or you can just go through one at random. Well, let's take the second stair to the left and let's see where MC Asher will lead us. No cards this time, old man? Cards. Perhaps. Cards could be helpful that he does this. Right? and empties the deck into the beyond. I don't know how gravity would work in such a place. It works like you'd expect it. So like it touches like one staircase that's going like horizontally flat and it's just like standing up still on that. So on and so forth. Hmm. So, yeah. I know these stairs can be tricky and... Um, uh, the only thing that I would do is I'll ch take out a small piece of chalk and just put an X down at the stair that we came through. Perfect. I like it. So do you guys just want to open a door at random then? Or... All right. Beautiful. Who opens the first door? All right. Jenny opens would... the first door. Oh, okay. So sure. I, otherwise, I'm I was sorry. going to say a man with magic cards tends to have magic hands. Why don't you try? <sighs> so, you'll jump to the left, it is, eh? What could go wrong? I like it. So, with his sigh of exasperation, Yiljum opens the first door. Um, second door to the left, as per his own words. When you open the door, what you see inside is very strange, Yiljum. There's no girl in here, nor is there any kind of petrified chest set. Um, you see two boars. Both boars are green. Both boars are inside of a kitchen. The windows in that kitchen are completely bricked up. One boar is fixing a cup of tea with its tusk, as the other one is trying to pin some kind of paper with a quill. Well, not with a quill, I should say, with its tusk being dipped in ink and then writing on the paper. Unfortunately, writing on paper is very hard when you have tusk, and it's just tearing the paper apart in frustration. Do you want to go into this room or try another door? They seem like they're having a tough enough time without three uh, strangers barging in on them. Maybe we should try another door, do you think? Maybe she, they saw the girl moseying through here. Green is the opposite of red, so enough. There are no opposites in colors, though, are there? Are there? Magic man? Well, try to imagine the opposite of green. 
the hair is on the back of your neck, you'll just stand on end as if you're being watched. And you look up and you see the boar fixing the tea is just staring directly at you. All right. So you mean hair standing up in, as in danger, danger, danger? No, as okay. in someone's watching you kind of thing. Okay, okay. And just from dealing with these oddities at times in our lives, would there be, you mentioned that the 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 other side generally is dangerous. Yeah. Um, is, not, is it always dangerous, or can you reason with insanity? It's not always dangerous, but not to cut corners. Boars are assholes, right? They eat a lot of things that aren't there. Sometimes they'll charge you. They'll make fun of your kids. It's never pleasant talking with a boar. Um, is there any other... You said they were in the kitchen, right? They're in a the kitchen. There's no doors in the kitchen, and the right. windows are like... Was my, that was just, yeah. This is just like a room? Yeah, just like a room, basically. All right, okay. So with, with that, then, and knowing that boss are assholes, as we all know, <laughs> because they have the bacon... Exactly. Um, might as well leave, eh? Perfect. So you close the door. Um, as you close the door, you guys are still basically in the way out. What do you guys want to do now? Uh, Jenny draws bacon on the door. All right. So you draw bacon on that door, then know what that one goes. Um, Finnick, would you open the next door, or would you still leave it to Yildrum? I think Finnick would look to Jenny. He right. doesn't want to make the decision. He doesn't want to uh, op have to open the door and have to deal with whatever comes <laughs> out. Uh, but he looks to Jenny and says, oh, it seems as though the old man's magic isn't working anymore. Why don't you give it a shot? Oh, sure. Uh, what what doors do I have to choose from? Pick just any door that you, you see. A bunch of doors or staircases that spiral around and move in weird directions. So there's as many doors or there are like grains of sand. There's a lot of grains of sand. So yeah, there's a lot of doors. <laughs> uh, I am going to open a pink door. Perfect. You open a pink door. Here's what you see. You see four different beds. There's a bed on each of the four walls you see inside of here, right? Each of the beds is shaped like a heart. And on standing on top of each of the beds is a porcelain doll. The porcelain dolls all look like Yildrum. Slightly awkward and strange, but this is what you see. Huh. The little girl in here. I closed the door. <laughs> you just close the door instantly. I like it. <laughs> All right. So uh, back in the way out, which way are we going this time? I draw a heart on that door. All right. Perfect. <clears throat> well, apparently the, the doors are not the solution, eh? And uh, so is this like a tower or is this just like a cube where there are, I mean, it, there's no up and down, right? It's, so like, it's not up and down. Sometimes it's a hallway. Sometimes it's a tower. Or it's a cube. Maybe even a sphere if it's feeling particularly weird that day. So, All right. I would just turn my back to, to them and then, well, maybe this is a question of trust, eh? And I just let myself fall over backwards into whatever is behind, beyond me. Perfect. Behind me, below me. So, Finnick, from your perspective, this is what you see. Yildrim just falls backwards, right, off of his staircase. First, he's falling down, then he's falling sideways, and then at this weird, like, perpendicular angle to where you two are, both Jenny and Finnick. And then Yildrim goes flying through a door. A dark door, a black door, a black door that's almost surrounded by this golden frame around it. The door spreads itself open. He goes through, and the door closes. And then the door starts moving away from the rest of you. Before we continue with you, Yildrum, Jenny and Finnick, what do you two do? I'm going to jump after him. Yeah, Finnick's just going to mutter, well, that can't be good, and would uh, follow close behind uh, Jenny. Both of you make me a dexterity saving th Oh, sorry, a dexterity check. You can use acrobatics if you have it. I'm uh, looking for a DC 17 here. Oh, boy. Uh, yeah, I pass with a 22. Perfect. Uh, 
Perfect. My, so my you, best friend. you both pass. So you guys move, you dance, you fall these different ways, and you get to the door, and then the door opens, and it eats both of you too. As the door closes, you're in a dark room. You see at the end of the room is a light. You realize you're quick, you quickly realize you're sort of a tunnel. Yildjim's already in the tunnel. It hasn't been very long since you two basically came through. Um, once you guys are in this tunnel, what do you do? So the first thing that Yildjim would do is kind of stand up and see that his clothing is in order and then just snip and uh, like a few um, little spirits start appearing and floating all around uh, kind of illuminating the hallway and uh, see if there are any breadcrumbs to follow so to say perfect i love that um when you turn on the lights base so to speak you see something strange kind of dancing in the air around you it's a single long strand of red hair and you realize that Jenny either came through this door recently or someone scalped her and came through here with her scalp. Whichever happened, one of these two happened. Well, that's good yeah. that I have a piece yeah. of her hair, which enormously empowers my scrying abilities if I need to uh, do so in the future. But for now, getting a small vial, putting the hair inside, cocking it with a little bit of cork, and putting it to, the, to like an assortment of other vials uh, around the bandolier. Uh, do I see anything down the tunnel? I have 120 feet dark vision. Um, you don't. Basically, at the end of the tunnel, it's just a light. The light is very bright. It's like a wall of light, almost. Um, but you're free to walk through it if you would like. Finnick would let the other two walk through before he does. Well, there's a piece of her hair. That's the right direction, wouldn't you say? I'm gonna draw, is there the black door behind us or is it nothing? There's a black door there still. I'm gonna put an X on it. I like it. So Yuljum, do you walk forward? I would I would walk forward towards the light <laughs> and um, uh, kind of right see and kind of take a look at it investigate it a little bit and see um, where it comes from or how tall it is, how wide it is. So it's a semicircle, it's a half circle, right? It's a hemisphere. Um, any other kind of words, a half circle you can think of, it's what it looks like. Um, it's big enough for about four or five people to walk through at once. It's about 10 feet in height. And it's literally just like a solid wall of white light. Um, if you touch it with like a finger or something, it goes right through. It's completely like, Light. Not really. Yeah, it's light, exactly. All right, so you said it's like a half sphere. Um, would, would this mean that there's it is inside a room or is it blockading like the passage? Um, it's basically the end of the passage. It's leading into something. All right. Hmm. <laughs> well... What do you think, Finnick, Ginny? If you see, Ginny uh, sticks like... her head through the light. All right, if she falls over dead, I know. <laughs> her head is decapitated. No, I'm just joking. Um, Ginny, you stick your head through the light. What you see is pretty odd. Um, you're in like a study, right? Like a lounge. Um, there's a door out of this lounge, oddly enough. So clearly, this is not just another weird, strange, one-off room. Um, there are bookcases everywhere. And you see this woman, this massive woman, easily like 800, 900 pounds, wearing this pink and purple dress with this hood over her head. She has in both of her swollen blue hands a massive book, and she's flipping through it page by page. She doesn't look at you, Jenny, but she turns around, and coming out of her back is the other torso of another woman, like an identical twin that is coming out the back. And the woman looks at you, the other half of the woman, I should say, and she opens her mouth and she says, more gas tonight? Weird. Indeed. Jenny pulls her head back in. 
All right, and you pull. Go ahead. I uh, I tell the other two what I see. Did Did we hear anything on the other side? You heard her speaking completely. You can even hear like the flipping of the book by the, her other torso. Okay. Just shrug, and then, since I heard her say other guests, so presumably there were ones before us, uh, moving to water. Perfect. So you step to the light. Jenny Finnick, what do you two do? I hop on through. Yeah, Finnick kind of goes through, but uh, just beyond um, this kind of light barrier. Playing it safe. Fair. So you move through first, you'll jump. And she looks to you, and her eyes go a bit wide, and she says, You're not a child. Old man should not be here. And I smile and say, I am a child at heart, though. And I kind of make a deep bow, and as I come up, I have like a, 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 ta a tablet, a table, a tablet with like some, some milk and cookies in my hand, and say like, but I search for other childs who might enjoy these. She walks, she walks forward, and when you present to her the illusion, um, her blue hands touch the illusion, and then like that, the illusion becomes real, right? And she picks up the entire plate, cookies and milk and all, and consumes the whole thing, right? The food, the silverware, everything else, the glass itself, in one bite, because her mouth, when it opens up, is big enough to consume an entire kid itself, right? And so she consumes the entire plate, and then she just closes her mouth and swallows and she says, that is very good. Thank you. By the way, um, is the regular woman talking or is it the torso that's coming out of her body? The torso is coming out of her body. So the regular woman is reading. The torso coming out of her body is the one talking and eating stuff. Okay. Finnick would look around uh, this room uh, what does it look like? Again, it's this very lavish, very well-decorated uh, study. You see decks of cards. You see all kinds of toys and whatnot. You see books. You see the desk. You see quill pens and everything. Um, on the walls are these paintings. And one painting will have like a um, like an ace of hearts on it. And underneath the ace of hearts, it'll have a woman biting the neck of another woman and draining her dry of blood. And then you'll see one. That's a spade. And then under that, you'll see an old man, pale in color, tax not taxing someone, but like holding out his hand for someone else to put money into. Just paintings like that. Yeah, so fin I think Finnick would just begin just walking around idly, looking at all of these things. Maybe he would uh, touch um, a book, kind of run his fingers along the spines. Um, and kind of maybe take one out and open it up. Um, when you touch the book and you pull it out, the book has a red cover. Um, and when you open it, what you're reading is the different ways to basically take a human being, um, flay them and drain them of their blood, right? And as you read through it, the woman says, the last person who came through here also liked my books. But that one, she said, was no fun. Oh, really? What did she do? Well, she told me she was a child. And I don't like it when childs come in here and become problems. So I helped her out so that way problems would not happen. Very sensible. Thank you. Could you point out to where she went? Well, I turned her into a small little mice, and I put her with all the other children, so the Queen of Hearts would not find her, nor the colorless queen, or the pale king. Is that the colorless queen over there? And I point to the painting where a woman is draining humans. No, when you point to that painting, she says, no, that's the Queen of Hearts. And that's the Pale King. And she points to the man who's, like, getting money from others. Yeah. So where would this miser be? Oh, I, I have some cheese for it, eh? I put them in my garden. 
but I can take you there if she lets me take you there. And she indicates with her thumb to the normal woman who's reading a book. And kind of looking around, taking a look over her shoulder and taking a look uh, to watch what she's reading. Um, you look in the book, and as she's slipping through the pages, you realize that this is a massive spell book, right? Mm -hmm. Only the spells aren't spells that you recognize or things that you cast yourself. Um, you can't really glean what the fuck these spells are, but nonetheless, you glean as a spell book. What would happen if I cast Comprehend Languages on myself? Um, you can. Go ahead, if you would like to. Yeah, very much so. All right. So you do this quick mumble jumbo, whatever you do to be able to do the spell. And you're reading the spell book, and the woman, both women, lets you read the spell book. Um, what you're basically reading is nonsense poem after nonsense poem after nonsense poem that, when put together and spoke, will probably make some kind of weird magical effect happen. Mm -hmm. Taking a look at it and like, like memorizing what I what I read in a in a second, uh, to second here. But um, obviously, if she's just like reading through it, I. There's some limits to nonsensical mm. things are harder to remember than structure usually, mm -hmm. right? So just taking a look at it and trying to memorize a few of these. I don't know. So Finnick and Jenny, at the news that she turned uh, Carolina into a mouse and put her with all the other children, quote unquote, what do you two do? Finnick would just kind of at that, that uh, at the news that she put him in the garden. Finnick would just kind of snap the book shut, put it very carefully back on the shelf. Oh. And uh, she would, or he would, um, he would look to the other woman. And he says, ah, yes, but of course a vision such as yourself would love to show us your wonderful, beautiful garden. And he would just kind of get closer to her just like this, pearly white grin on his face. As you get closer, the upper torso coming out the back door and speaking turns towards you, and its head kind of like elongates, kind of like a slug coming out of its shell, right? And it gets closer into your face. So it's almost pressing against your cheek, almost but not quite. And she opens her mouth, and this stench of cookies and broken glass like wafts over you. And she says to you, I can show you if she lets me. And you realize she's repeating herself from what she just said. And then the neck kind of slides back into like the shell of the body. Yes, of course. And has the woman, um, the other woman reading, made any motion at all to acknowledge our presence? Zero whatsoever. And what beautiful lady would let her uh, go uh, to show us this garden? But of course a love poem would, would indeed. And while the reading woman doesn't respond, the slug-necked woman, as I'll start calling her from now on, does. And she says, love poems, very sweet for the Marquess, make us feel like Baroness instead. And kind of looking towards, well, I heard drunk people say the curious, most curious things, eh? What do you say, Ginny? Mm -hmm. Jenny is kind of quiet. And she's thinking. OK. Not weaving so much anymore. Maybe this ought, this ought to sober her up a bit, eh? <laughs> and then um, Yildirim says, she walks in the beauty like the night of cloudless climes and starry skies. She is the Marquess 
of the beyond. When you say the poem, when you say it to her, um, the reading half stops reading. And then she repeats your poem in this dark, deep, almost evil tongue, like that. And as she's repeating what you're saying in this twisted tongue, the books begin to vibrate. And then blood becomes to come pour, like drip, I'll say, not pour, drip out of the books all around you on the shelves. And then the paintings begin to move. And the man receiving taxes begins to choke the man who's getting the taxes from. And the woman who's being drained of blood begins to scream and shake her heart, her, her arms. And I need every one of you three to make me a wisdom saving throw. Fourteen. Oh wow. Oh man, this is gonna be fun. Twelve. Okay, so we have two failures. Finnick, you're the one success. Um all three of you, like that, turn into animals. In particular, you turn into three different gophers. Um, unfortunately for the people who failed the saving throw, so who forgot under a 16, which is going to be Yojim and Jenny, your intelligence is reduced down to one, as you now have the intelligence of a gopher. She then bends down the Marquest, and she scoops you all up in her arms. She says, she says I can take you to the garden now. And she begins to walk. She walks through the door. And as she's doing this, um, tell me, Gopher Finnick, what are you doing? Finnick is just looking to the other two, kind of, like, desperately. Um, but he is seeing that they might show that uh, they're not the most intelligent thing, that they've lost that. Um, so he is for now, uh, going to be trying to copy their movements to, uh, maybe convince her that, um, he too has no more intelligence and is just this normal gopher. Perfect. Um, she reaches the door, she opens the door with her mouth and on the other side of the door, you three see is the door is bricked off, right? And so her mouth opens up again, big enough to swallow a person, and she throws all three of you in to her mouth. And the three of you go flying through this darkness, this void, this abyss, until so you hit ground, grassy ground, and there are lamps everywhere lighting the world around you guys. And in this grass lit stomach, sorry, this grass lantern lit stomach of the Marquess, you see a bunch of different animals. You see finches, you see prairie dogs, you see rats and mice and rabbits and small birds and all kinds of weird shit like that, right? Some of them are lounging around, playing ball with each other or giggling to each other. Others are moving around like they're wild animals. In fact, Finnick, you realize that they're moving around like both um, Yildrum and Jenny are doing. Before we continue, Yojim and Jenny, please make me a, another wisdom saving throw. Uh, Nineteen. Perfect. Twenty-six. Perfect. Both of your intelligences return back to what they once were. And you look around, you realize you're also in this new kind of demi plane in the Marquess's stomach, right? And what do you three do now that you're here? Can we speak? You can't, no, yes, you can't speak. Because if you're an animal, that might not be so easy, eh? <laughs> All right, so if we can speak and say, like, well, we're looking for a mice with red hair. Hmm. And Jenny is looking around for her alcohol and seems a little sad because she can't drink anymore without her stuff. Mm, I guess we got to sniff around for her and I make a perception check for any mice that are around. All right, so go ahead and put that into the side chat for me. And Finnick, what are you doing? Would I be able to cast spells as a gopher ferret? Um, the required material component? Yes, you can. 
So <laughs> Finnick is like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Finnick is just kind of like looking at himself, looking at his paws, just with this as much of a disgusted face as the gopher can make. He's like, oh, I don't, I was never one for rodents. It shows too much of my true self. And he would cast uh, Dispel Magic, um, which I can choose a magical effect mm -hmm. uh, within 120 feet. Perfect. And so you're I'm... doing it on yourself? Uh, yes. Perfect. Um, as you do so, the magic, not the magic, the body around you kind of shimmers like a heat haze. Right, and it begins to peel itself away, and as it does so, the darkness around you gets deeper and deeper and deeper. Um, Yildrum and Jenny, you turn to look to each other, and you see that Finnick is gone. He's not there in human form. He's not there in gopher form. He's just completely gone. Um, and with your perception check as well, Jenny, since you didn't make one of the side chat, you do see a mouse. Now, as you see that mouse, the mouse sees you. And it stares at you for a moment. And the mouse is kind of like this brunette colored mouse, right? And then a squirrel saunters over, grabs the mouse by the back of its neck, and begins to eat its face off. As blood spews out and the mouse screams bloody murder, how do you two respond to both that and the disappearance of Fennec? So. Dispelling magic. So I saw her cast the spell, right? So that's something I was aware. And I can dispel magic myself, so I would guess I would know what she did. Correct. Okay. So I'm not super worried about that. And then we see this kind of rodent fight break out. I'm, I'm going <laughs> to yeah. run over and kick the, the squirrel in the face. As you run over and you kick the squirrel, no attack all needed, the squirrel's like kicked and it looks at you strangely. And then he says, what are you doing? I'm having a meal over here. We're looking for a, a little mouse. Not this little that? mouse. This little mouse is stupid. They didn't keep your smarts like I kept my smarts. If you don't keep your smarts, you get eaten, duh. It's the rules in here. So. You see any other mice? Maybe with red hair? I see lots of mice with red hair. Some with no smarts, some with lots of smarts. I eat the ones with no smarts. I don't care about the ones with smarts. So You seem a little nuts, my friend. No, it's just some kind of joke because I'm a squirrel I don't like. It. I don't like jokes. I don't like the smarts for jokes. I don't like the smarts to be eaten. Marquise, what I missed earlier is what you said about the spell casting. What about, oh, yeah, you can spell cast. You have your intelligence. Okay, so what I would do, I would do cast Hallucinatory Terrain and try to make, a, is it a trade fair? Like with the ones with the um, like shooting ranges and auto scooter and kind of stuff yeah. like this. So you make a basically a big ass animal trade fair inside of this thing's like stomach yes. semi plan, right? Mm -hmm. Instantly, all the small animals begin freaking the fuck out because like where the hell did all this shit pop up from? But these are all, as you realize, or as you might conclude, children in animal form, right? So the ones with smarts, as described by the squirrel, instantly begin running around and trying to interact with the hallucinations that you're conjuring up, right? And um, just from taking in the ones that are kind of going there, I would then kind of play the the person who would kind of cater to them and say, "Hiri, hiri, come to the trade fair of the gullet," and then kind of continue to to talk to to them and trying to entertain them, and therefore also kind of massage like informations out of them. If if will be like, I'm searching for the the, the chessboard. I'm searching for the, the white knights and the black knights and yada, 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 right? So they're kind of going that direction. Simon, that's incredibly fucking clever. I've never seen the spell used like that. So you get another point of inspiration because that's a cool ass idea. Um, and it works. Um, as these rodents and these birds and whatnot start coming up to yield Jim, Jenny, you see this happening. Um, the squirrel you're with is still eating that mouse and looking at you like you're some kind of asshole for smacking him for eating. Uh, what are you going to do, Jenny? Jenny shakes her head. Ever see a mouse named Caroline? I mean, Carolina. Carolina, I ain't seen no Carolina. But I don't bother learning names. Only names I know is me, myself, and I, which is not really a name. It's pronouns for myself. Ugh. 
Ginny just walks away and goes to see what uh, the magic man is doing. All right, so you walk back to where the magic man's at. As you do so, Finnick, we move back to you for a moment. Finnick, um, when you kind of like blinked and the darkness was gone, you're no longer in the dim eye plane. You're no longer in the way out. Instead, you're sitting in a forest clearing. All right, and there is a well, maybe 16 or 17 feet away from you, a stone well with a pail over top, of course, to be lowered down. The trees around you are all varying shades of green, but they're perfectly like conical, right? Like hats, and they're very close together. Um, you can move through them, of course, but they're just trees, basically. It's like a tightly packed forest. To your west, you hear the sound of water running, and to the south, you just see a lot of mist. As you reappear here without your friends, without anything else, what do you do, Finnick? What's your reaction? Finnick would just kind of just look around. <sighs> this is not what I thought was going to happen, but it never is. And he just kind of is wiping the, the dust and the grime off of his clothes imaginary or there and he's just kind of looking at his hands and ah, but that is better and he would actually go over to the well um and he is going to take one of his like maybe like a little copper piece and just kind of toss it down just to see if it plinks if there's water if there's not you toss down the copper coin and you hear it coming out from the well thanks mister and when you look down, you're going to see three or four kids at the bottom of the well staring back at you. And the kid who has the coin looks back up to you and says, but we prefer things that start with the letter S. And this is a coin which starts with the letter C or K. I'm not quite sure, but it starts with one of them. And that's not an S. And the other like three kids kind of like nod and like agreeance. They have like dirty faces and everything. He would nod and he would say, very reasonable, very reasonable. You seem like very intelligent children. Uh, say you wouldn't have uh, seen a girl your size, red hair running about. You have something for the well letter S? Because if you give us that, we can give you food or we can give you an answer to your question, maybe. Hmm. And he would just, all right. Uh, and uh, he has some of the silver that the uh, Gerald gave him, and he would kind of toss one of those down. There, a silver coin. All right, Starts perfect. The boy captures it. He says, thanks again, mister. We appreciate your contribution to our state fund down here. Um, that being said, can you repeat your question in six words or less? Have you seen a red? <laughs> Does hyphens count as one word? <laughs> hyphens do not count as one word. So have you seen a red? Girl. <laughs> That's red, right. And then he's going to just swear under his breath. Um, the, the boy kind of like, what red girl? He looks at the other three children and they kind of huddle up and they talk for a solid like a minute. And then the spokesperson kid looks back up and he says, well, we haven't seen a red girl, perhaps. If you mean like a flayed girl, um, no, no, we haven't seen one of those. We don't go to the Queen of Hearts castle that often to see one. <sighs> That's what I thought. If you got more S, more silver coins, or other things to start with S, we can we can answer some more questions or give you some water. There's lots of water downhill on account of it being a well and all. Finnick would stop and he would begin making this horrible noise in the back of his throat. I see and where this is going. <laughs> 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 and um, some spit would come out of his mouth and just drop to the well below. It hits the, the spokesperson can on the cheek and he goes, ugh, spittle, saliva, uh, scum. 
All right, that's three S's. You three questions. <sighs> Is <laughs> like a council words. <laughs> Is there a magical garden nearby? Is one of them. Nope. I think. Where is a red headed girl? Red haired, sorry, haired. Well, a red headed girl came by here earlier. We told her to get in the well because there's some pale knights to the south, you know, vampires that kind of eat children and whatnot. But the girl was like, I don't know, the girl was kind of weird, so she didn't want to come down here. So she went running off um, that way. And he just points straight up, and he's like, but kind of that way, too. And he points to the west. So he pointed to the west and where? And uh, Basically up into the west. Oh, up into the west. Okay. Why are you down here? Is there a safer place to be from vampires? I mean, running water in a well? Can't think of a better place if you ask me, right? And then the kid looks and I'm like, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty accurate. Finnick just kind of nods and just kind well, of shrugs. <laughs> <laughs> Finnick, what he nods and. All right. Well, thank you, children. You were a bit of help. Not a problem. If you got more S things, just come back. We'll open all night, uh, most days of the week. Uh, weekends were kind of absent though, so be careful for that. And with that, the camera is going to change uh, back to you, Yildrim. So Yildrim, you basically become like the ringmaster of all these small children animals, right? And you're right. applying information, or you're trying to get information. I wouldn't have conjured like a a head, the ma mm -hmm. mage's head, like a gopher with a head. Perfect. I love it. So you're a gopher with a hat who means business, right? You're doing mm -hmm. all these fancy hallucination tricks. Um, what kind of information are you trying to get? So I would actually want to know what this place is that I saw. Um, Carolina in at the the chessboard. That's basically what I want and where it would be if possible. All right. So another gopher looks to you and he says, she says, she says to you, well, we're inside the Marquesa's stomach. Indeed. Yeah, but you were you were somewhere else before she ate. Well, we were in the way out. Uh, we were running, exploring, wandering around. Um, personally, me, right? I was playing ball with a friend, and the ball went off the edge of a cliff, and then I went down the cliff to another checker piece, and then I was in the Marquess's uh, room. So, so what do you remember when you fell down to the checker piece? I just went down the checker piece and there was a door and the ball went through the door and then I went through the door and then I went after the ball and I closed the door because you don't want to leave a door open. That's kind of rude, don't you think? And then yes. and, and yes. what would what, this door be? What color? What, what size? Was it, it a double door? A double door, yes. It's made out of, um, what, what's that? That material, Um, it's kind of shiny, kind of like... Not hard. It's not like metal. Not hard to the touch. But like, if you bite it, it tastes really bad, like rubber. Well, oh, you know, you don't have to answer. It's one of those doors. And she and nods to herself, like sagely, for giving such a good answer. <laughs> yeah, great. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> and I gotta say, like, well, there's an extra ticket for you then. <laughs> she takes the ticket. Um, and when she does so, a bird of paradise in the back screams out. And he says, you just wait just a gosh darn willy whopping second. This shit isn't real. <laughs> and like the sudden curse word, I'm going to like take you off guard, Yilgrim. Uh, Yilgrim, as the bird of paradise pokes like a stand, like a, like, a, like a water gun stand, and just goes straight through it. And then he does it again. And then the other animals are like, what in tarnation is going on here? Well, it doesn't make it any less magical. Yes, it does make it less magical. I can't shoot the water. What's the point of this? 
He's just pecking it again to just pecking like the sand ground. Oh, sorry, the grass ground. There we go. Well, it's a little better than grass, isn't it? He looks to you. And if a bird could give you like a dude, what are you talking about? This grass is a great look. That's the kind of look, even though oddly specific, that this bird is giving you. The oddly specific look. <laughs> I love it. Mm -hmm. I, I just raise a brow with my black gopher eyes, like, at this, at, point, this bird. at this point, you realize the animals, the children, uh, polymorph animals, are getting very angry. Um, and you begin to have, like, PTSD flashbacks to the riders, I guess, just earlier this day when Carolina went missing. Yeah. So I just truck and say, like, it's time to leave. See ya. Just by magic. Are you going to do it for uh, Ginny, too, or just yourself? Uh, You're going to leave me to die. <laughs> just leave me to I mean, you have a way out here. I can leave whenever I want. I don't. <laughs> uh, fine. So her uh, first. Uh, she's in range because it's under 20 range, feet, right? Yeah. So if, she, if, she, if she's not with me. All right. So dispel, dispel her. Perfect. Um, Yojum, since you're a man of much more educated and powerful magic than Thinnick is, you realize what's happening is that as you dispel the magic on yourself, you're basically being teleported out of this demi plane, right? Yeah. I don't no longer meet the requirements of being in here. Um, Finnick, you hear like a puff, like a pop, and then like smoke behind you. And then as it fades, you turn around and you see both Yildjum and Ginny standing there. Ah, excellent. I have a trail, uh, thanks to these well children. And I have a door. Well children's kind of offensive. You could just call us children. <laughs> I just wanted to be descriptive. That's that's fine. That's okay. They accept it. And um, the three of you begin to hear voices coming from the south, from this mist-filled part of the forest to the south. Jenny happily takes a drink. And, well, let's get going. Thank you, well, children. I wish you well. Oh. <laughs> so do you guys want to go to the south to follow the voices, or you go with Phoenix Trail to the west? I guess the west, right? I mean... Yeah, I think Finnick would recommend the west. <laughs> Perfect. Um, as you do so, like you begin to move through these densely packed trees, and then you see something strange. You see a sloth. The sloth is hanging from a branch um, in these perfectly conical trees. And on the sloth's left leg is a boot. A boot meant for a person, obviously, because the boot is huge and very ornate and very nice and very oddly pale. Right? Mm -hmm. The sloth looks down to you guys. And um, he says to you very slowly, Please don't say I am here. And he begins to slothily, slovenly move through the trees. What do you guys do? Do you just keep going? How do you react? Finnick would look up at him and just say, why? Who are you hiding from? To whom shall we say that you're not here so I don't get the wrong person? And the sloth stops. Um, it's barely moved six inches since you started talking. And he looks back down to you, taking painstakingly long. I cannot exaggerate how slow it is for this thing to move. And he says to you again, Just keep your tree fucking mouth closed, please. And he begins again to slovenly move away. Jenny waves. Bye. I had to put in so much effort to be so rude. <laughs> Take a point of inspiration for that line, Megan. <laughs> Perfect. So do you guys just keep going or what? 
I guess so. Perfect. You keep moving to the west until you come to a river. Um, this river is maybe about 200 feet in width. It goes this way, that way, through these bends. You can't see where it goes. Um, now that you're kind of standing on a shore, you can kind of see a bit better now what the environment's like. Um, you see to the north this massive watchtower that goes maybe two miles into the sky, right? There's nothing there, no one on top, and it looks very old, very overgrown. Right by plants and vines and whatnot. I think you see more trees to the west. Um, what do you guys want to do? So we haven't seen any other door frame or door or anything like that, right? You have not. How far did we move in this forest now at, the, at this point? You've been walking for maybe 10, 15 minutes to get to this part of the forest. So about a mile. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Time for another reading, it is, eh? So Sitting. you... Go ahead. I would try to sit down and... Um, scry the place which I saw before and scry Ginny again and see, and see if she has moved and this time I would also try to get a little bit more vision of the area where she is. Perfect. So she has not moved. First thing you realize. Second thing you realize is you see this giant chessboard. You realize how these pieces, these stone pieces are life-sized. Right? They're Did, they huge. Move? Did they move in the meantime? They have not moved whatsoever. Nothing has touched them. Um, and then you see surrounding this chessboard are just these massive, perfectly conical trees, much like the ones that are surrounding you guys now. Okay. Well, then I'll just cast a um, locate creature. Um, you know that she's directly to the west of you. So the 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 extent of the spell is thousand feet away from me. Thousand feet. I'll say that's good enough. Um, just because you could probably pick up like clues or whatnot on the way there that just basically tell you she's directly to the west of you. All right. Did you say this to the others? Yeah, absolutely. I say like I um what I do is I kind of go through my stuff and get like the 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 collarbone of a of a chicken and kind of break it. And put it into a put it to to uh, to a bowl and, and put some water into the bowl and some some herbs and some alcohol on top of it and then I light the alcohol and I hum mm, and then I open my eyes and say like she is this direction. I imagine Finnick. She's like, oh, that's neat. <laughs> yeah, Finnick definitely has an interest in what he does. Like he just. He might even sometimes get like a little bit too close um, to Yild <clears throat> Yildrum when he does these kind of things, just like with this th this interest. Like she's this direction. Oh, you're close. <laughs> Perfect. As I say this, uh, Jenny, you realize very acutely because you're drunk, and being drunk makes you wiser that you're still on the wrong side of the river to go west. Mm -hmm. We need to go over the river. And Jenny hasn't really watched much of the magical act. Just his usual shtick. She's just been kind of stirring her keg of alcohol with her ladle, waiting patiently and glancing at the river, thinking. So just, just from gauging the weight of those two, um, how heavy would I imagine them being combined would they exceed 500 pounds <laughs> um maybe an inappropriate question to ask finnick and jenny but i do not think they would all right with that i would then cast fly on myself cast tensor's floating disc sit their asses on the disc and fly over the river <laughs> <laughs> so you guys are now on top of this floating disc um, as it levitates, uh, with your passive perception, particularly you, Finnick, um, you hear something to the south. You hear what sounds like that, that very familiar snapping of breaking and falling trees, right? And you can tell that something to the south 
is moving not only north, but also westwards, the same direction you're moving through this conical forest. Soon, just a, maybe a second or two later, the rest of you also hear these sounds. And this is as the disc is floating over the water. Jenny puts her arm around Finnick. Did you hear that? Yes. And he would just kind of take his take the her arm and just kind of place it down. Just he wouldn't even say anything while while he's saying yes. Just like take the arm down from her, but he is looking um, towards the the that direction. What do you think it is? Um, trees snapping. Something following us, perhaps. Really, trees. You thought that sound was trees. Ah. I hear trees breaking. I I don't know if it's a tree. Do you know if it's a tree? And he just kind of he's gonna say something, but he then he just stops. <laughs> I've learned to not question well, I've learned to question many of the uh sounds. Ah, damn it. I was hoping it was trees, but now you've gotten my mind all mixed up. Now I'm not sure. And he just is like looking angrily into the distance of these trees. I fucking love it. Uh, Yuljum, what are you doing? Flying upwards a little Perfect. bit more. <laughs> so, the disc kind of floating with me. <laughs> so you, you hover upwards with the disc behind you um, yeah. to you above the trees. And yeah, something is definitely cutting a swath through these trees. And you also see this another clearing south of where you guys are. Um, chock full of mist. It's the only part of the entire place that has mist in it, right? But it's almost overwhelmingly thick there. Um, and something is moving from that mist towards the river. Uh, you don't see what because of how densely packed the trees are, but something is definitely moving. Uh, Ginny is starting to take a bit of fishing line, wrap it around a bell, and then wrapping that line around the dart. And does it three times with three different darts and three different bells. All right. Now, what do the rest of you two do? Still trying to get westwards, right? Do you want to stay at your elevation, Yildjian? I mean, as long as there's not something coming and shooting directly in our direction. Perfect. Like right. staying a good, I don't know, staying a good like 30, 40 feet above like water level, I think is All right. appropriate right now. So you move back into where these trees are, these trees being maybe 70 to 100 feet in height, right? You move back into those trees and these weird conical branches are slapping you guys in the face, I imagine. Incredibly unpleasant. Not good for having tea or makeup or any of that stuff, unfortunately. Um, but you guys continue to move westwards. Go ahead, Yildjum. Weren't we trying to cross a river? Yeah, you cross the river now. Crossing the river is simple and easy. Do we need to stay up then? I, I, that, that was my entire... I, like, Do I you didn't... want to break the disc? I mean, we can just go down and see what it's, what's up, if it's like more pleasant. Like, I care about my skin, okay? It's, I'm old and it's... <laughs> it's... <laughs> so, Yildrum lowers the disc, realizing that these trees are not very old man face friendly, and you guys are all on the ground. You guys just keep walking westwards? Yeah. Uh, Finnick has like a lot of face paint on as part of being like an acrobat. Mm -hmm. So now his face is just like a mess of smeared uh, makeup of reds and blacks and whites. Kind of going over to him. You look ha terrible. Kind of snap the finger and press. I can't pronounce the word in English. Press the digitization. Yes. <laughs> right. Just... Oh, sorry, Marky. Uh, you should have just said it in German, Simon. That would have been like, okay. <laughs> sure, that sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude, you cast that thing. Um, anyway, you fix her face. Uh, what are you going to say, uh, Em? I look about the same, except my my makeup is still a bit smudged, like just eyeliner soaked down, as it regularly does. I just have a few extra pine needles in my hair. And I, I pull a few out of my alcohol. Perfect. I like it. So now either improved in quality, a.k.a. Fennec, or enhanced in flavor, a.k.a. your alcohol, Jenny, um, you guys continue to move to the west. Um, eventually, you hear the snapping of trees stop 
And then it starts again a hell of a lot closer than where it was earlier. And you put two and two together and know that it's crossed the river, whatever this thing is. Um, but you guys see off in the distance between the trees a light as if there's a clearing there. And when you get closer, you realize, you see before you, is this massive 80 foot by 80 foot size chessboard with these gigantuan life-size stone pieces covering it. What do you guys want to do? You want to wait for whatever is following us and ambush it? No. Why would we just want to fight anything here? I mean, I don't know. Why not? I th you would get hurt. That's awful. Do you? I mean, I just went through several pine trees and a few scratches. Well, then you should have ducked. It's kind of hard to duck when I'm sitting on a disc. I mean, Yildrim did just fix my face, and he would just kind of, like, feel it up and just... I, I don't want to get it all dirty again. Fighting. Also for no reason. Anyway, any of you spare... Play this game? Chess? Mm. So do we sh see um, Carolina? You guys look around. Um, you see all these different chess pieces and everything. And then one beside you, Finnick, opens its eyes. And then it lurches outwards and is going to fall from its pedestal and grab you by the waist and scream out, Finnick, oh, please, oh, please, golly gosh, Finnick, is that you? And you hear Carolina's voice coming from this weird pawn statue. And for the first time, you see concern and worry in Phoenix's eyes, replacing this kind of coy indifference. And, uh, what'd you say? Carolina, what, what happened? Oh, Phoenix, Phoenix, my day has just been one rotten, awful, gosh darn day. I started when I went to the door. I just want to see what's on the other side of the door. The owner told me not to, but it was such a big door with a big lock, and it was a way out. And I was like, if it's a way out, it has to be a way in somewhere. And so I went in, thinking I'd go somewhere. And oh gosh, Finnick, it's been rotten terrible. That old dang, murdy, mean sloth turned me into this. Uh, the sloth, eh? Yes, yeah, the knew sloth. He was rude. Did you yes, tell him dude. where? Did you tell someone where he was? No, I, I, I told him that if he was going to keep being mean to me, I was going to tell someone where he was because he kept telling me not to tell him where anyone was. And then he kept using these big mean words. I didn't like it, so I told him, "Listen here, little sloth. You say one more thing to me like that, and I swear on my shoes I will go tell somebody." And then boom, he made me like this. Uh... So taking a look. At this play field, um, she is in position of a pawn. Correct. Mm -hmm. Is she on the white or on the black side? Black. She's on the black side. Has mm -hmm. the white side? So okay. So chess. Obviously, you start in the two edge rows, right? Yep. Um, is this a fresh field, or is there? It looks. Does it look like in a play state? It's a fresh field. And this one white pawn or knight, I guess, moved. Oh uh, no, so she's not a knight, she's a pawn. Um she didn't no, no. move. Oh, she's she's a black she is a black pawn and yeah. she stands basically in, in row with the other black pawns, which yes. are just stone kind of figurines. Yeah. So nothing has moved. It's a completely fresh field. No so did, pieces. Did the moved. white did one of the white pieces move already? They have not. Hmm. Okay. Um as Caroline is telling you what happened, Finnick, the sound of broken trees is even louder now. And then you hear this rumbling voice is fee fi fro bum Where's that sloth little girl who's running? And then you hear a second voice accompanying it saying, You messed up the rhyme. That's not running does it rhyme with from. And more cheese just like break angrily as these voices get louder and louder. Uh hmm. 
So, ignoring all this commotion, would start to kind of circulate the entire plate board and see if there's any inscriptions or if there's any kind of levers or buttons or whatever, or any other oddities. You see these grooves, right? These grooves around the entire board. And when you bend down to look at them, Yildrim, you realize that these, bro these grooves these wear like rust brown stain into them. And then after another second of thinking, you realize that blood has been poured into these grooves. And they are the on the circumference of the board? Correct. Okay. Also, as you're moving around, um, please make me an intelligence check with investigation. Any of you three can do this. Uh, could I get that? Yeah. All right. And what did you get, Yildrum? 27. Perfect. And what did you get, Jenny? Um, investigation? Yeah. Straight okay. eight. Got it. I was just going <laughs> to offer to do the help action because oh. intelligence so, is not my forte. Fennec and Yildrum, you realize that the two white pawns, sorry, the two white rooks are illusionary. When you touch them or when you look at them, you see they kind of flicker in like a strobe light before they snap back into place. And it came to the not real. The rooks are the ones that run di diagonally, right? No, the rooks are the ones who move in straight lines across the board. Okay. So they want on the edges then, on the left and the, the right. edges, correct. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. The bishops, right. the bishops run diagonally, all right. Correct. <sighs> I see. Okay, I have an idea. I will cast uh, my... Um, is it not minor illusion? It's the level one. What is it? Oh, I actually don't have that. <laughs> it was still my image. That's what we're looking for. I have minor image. I, 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 minor illusion. I don't have the other spell. I just double checked it. I don't have it. So just minor image, and I'll just cast the illusion of a sloth on one of the f illusion spaces with the rook. I like it. As you do so, a massive tree falls down across the board and this great dust this great wave of dust kicks up right and mm. as the, this this bellowing plume spreads out covering the entire board you hear now where is it and then you hear something heavy move through the air and you hear a shattering stone and as the dust begins to lower you see the two missing pale looks um they're both covered in this noble finery and they're both covered and dry blood. And the crowns are covered in these massive conical hats. One of the rooks is covering a, is held is holding a flail in their hands. The other one holding a mace. These are both 15 foot tall. Their heads are so big that their bodies can barely support them. And you see broken black pawns just scattering the field now. And they're looking around angrily, looking for something. Um, one of them sees you three. And they look at you directly and they say, Do you know where girl and sloth are? Girl and sloth. Have you but checked the, the well? Well, the one with the mace says that. And then he looks to the one with the uh, flail. And the one on the floor like feels like a, like a kid like temper tantrum like one of these. And when he does so, the flail swings down and smashes some more of the cut of the pale colored pieces, destroying two of the pawns and destroying the space where one of the illusionary rooks was at, not the one with the sloth on it. Taking a closer look at these statues, um, usually they're like towers, right? Like towers of like. Castle towers or whatever. Uh, what are what are they the rep representing? What how are they looking? So they're tall and they have these weapons, but the tall, the humanoid, uh, okay. giant heads with very finely, extremely nicely clothed bodies that seem almost too small to carry heads so big. So looking at the heads then closer, and especially looking at their eyes, uh, do they seem blind? 
They are not blind. They have big, wide black eyes looking around. Mm. Okay. And at your lack of an answer to the questions, one of them, the one with the hammer, steps forward two more times and he says, You know where the kids are. And uh, Finnick would kind of step forward and just shake his head. But he'd say, Would you mind telling us we're just traveling? A traveling uh, band of entertainers. Uh, would you mind telling us why you're looking for this sloth and girl? And I don't uh, answer questions. And he like he stumbles forward like a child would. He's like yelling at an adult. And as he's doing so, he's breaking ponds beside him. Um, the only one that's not broken from that row is Carolina, who's right beside you, Fennec. And the rook looks down on you and he says... Pale king want child and want sloth who took his boot. Where child? I see. I think she's hiding in the tower. We look in tower or nice looking tower, nice looking tower. And the one with the flail is standing there, still throwing a tantrum over the well comet. And he says, "Yes, the nice looking tower." You might want to look again. We Is look again. And then they start smashing more pieces. This time, the, the colorless pieces, destroying the queen, another pawn, and a bishop. And I say, and I hold up my hand, hey, hey, I'll show you. There's a secret. Secret. And the one with the hammer looks at you, and he lowers his head, and his for his massive, just giant face is going to basically rest itself on your forehead, Jenny. And the two eyes go cross-eyed to look at you, and he says. If it's not a fun secret, gray pale nights will suck your neck dry. So here's a question. Um, can I move out of their sight, out of their kind of awareness, and cast a spell without them noticing? You can maybe move behind a piece and try doing so. It would be a, uh, I'm going to say a stealth check to do so. <laughs> Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, most of their attention is on me right now, isn't yep. it? Which is why he does not have disadvantage on the stuff check. Yeah. I will try, and I will use one of my um, inspiration tokens to give so. me advantage on it, so maybe I don't suck as much. But what I want to do is uh, cast Scatter, um, which basically is like a group blink. A group, um, uh, fairy, uh, what's it called? Not fairy step, um, misty step, misty step, yeah. So it's a 120 range, 20 foot range, and I can use up to five creatures to move them mm -hmm. if they're willing, then it's fine. If they're not willing, they get a safe. And what I want to do is move me, myself, and I, which is three of the six, mm -hmm. and <laughs> um, Carolina. And um, I guess, I don't know if the other two are fine with that as well, but that would be right. what I wanted to do. And where are you trying to move you three to or four to? Away from them behind some trees All right. to, get, to get them out of there and see what happens. Perfect. What does it look like as a spell takes effect? So let me first roll my stealth check. All right. <laughs> So with advantage, I rolled a nine. <laughs> Perfect. Um, they will see you doing this spell. So go ahead and tell me what it looks like. So concentrating and just drawing, um, drawing a, a globe, like a, a glass orb in, in the hands and kind of concentrating for the second. The glass orb goes, um, there seems to be a, a fog creating inside of the glass orb, making it opaque, and I just, like, shatter it on the ground, a poof of fog just, like, quickly dis uh, kind of disperses, but also before it completely vanishes in um, kind of surrounds uh, surrounds us four people, I guess, uh, and as the as it finally completely disperses, um, yeah, we're not there anymore, but clearly Perfect. they saw, saw me. So you're, about the 100, so you're about 120 feet away. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but... You look around, you know, Jim. Perfect. You see Finnick. Perfect. You see Ginny. You do not see Carolina. Okay. 
And then you start hearing screaming coming from almost like the east of where you guys are at right now. Uh, clearly coming from the two rooks and then the smashing of stones as they begin breaking more pieces. What do you guys do? Finnick is going to immediately l- just look at the old man with this horrified look and just immediately disappear as he casts invisibility just, on himself. Just shrug, just shrug. She was supposed to be here with us. <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, so you go invisible Finnick Jenny what do you do Jenny just looks very pale and looks at the wizard I was trying to lure them away so you would have more time to figure it out well yes and I try to use the situation to our advantage, eh? They were destroying so much. I don't think we had much time. Where's... Sure. What do we do now, eh? So, uh, Finnick. Finnick is invisible. What are you doing now, Finnick? Uh, Finnick is charging uh, yeah. towards the uh, the chess... Chess bot. Chess Perfect. Board. So because these trees are so densely packed, um, it's difficult terrain, right? And so it's going to take you about a full-on minute by the time you get there. So your invisibility will wear off as you reach the chess board. Uh, what are the other two of you doing? Did you, did you cast invisibility or greater invisibility? Uh, just invisibility, which lasts up to an hour. Oh, yeah. JK. So you still have your invisibility on then. Perfect. <sighs> All right. All right. That sucks. Well... Uh, don't think we can reason with them anymore, eh? Well, let's see what I did. Can I you? Have, but... Yes? Could you turn me into the sloth? Of course. Become a sloth. Pull him off. Is the boot on the left foot? I don't think you, you can want... polymorph the boot, but you could polymorph her into a sloth. I can use the minor illusion to make a boot. You could, but the minor illusion has to be basically recast every turn because it only stays in like its little square. So yep. you'd be basically dedicating your action to keeping that minor illusion up if you want right. to do that. Right. Perfect. All right. All right. I'm going to climb up into the trees and head over as quickly as I can. Perfect. So I sit. Okay. So that works too. Yeah. So fine. Mm-hmm. Okay. And I kind of try to head back with le- less of a hasty step toward back towards the chessboard, perhaps. Perfect. I like it. So, Finnick, you're the first one to get there. Um, luckily, Carolina has not yet been destroyed. Unluckily, they've picked up Carolina's piece, and they're looking at it very closely. And the one the hammer goes, should we smash this one or take it back as proof? And the one the flail goes, we should eat it. And I think at this point, immediately, um, how tall is Carolina? In this form, uh, given that she's basically a statue on top of a pedestal, she's like eight foot in height. Uh, like just regular. Carolina. Regular? She's like, I don't know, like an eight year old girl. So she's like four foot three or some shit like that. Okay. Um, Finnick is going to cast Disguise Self on himself and make him look as much like Carolina as he can. Um, He'll be a bit taller um, than she was, but... I like it. Perfect. Uh, so you turn yourself into Carolina. Um, the invisibility falls away and you walk into the chessboard. They don't notice you yet. What do you do? Hey, you big, bad brutes. I'm right over here. In, her, in his best <laughs> little girl voice. I love it. Perfect. <laughs> hey the there, one... you big, bad brutes. Perfect. The one with the hammer drops the statue of Caroline to the ground, um, cracks spider web through her body. But she has a break. And he looks to you and he says, And he begins to kind of march forward in that child way, and his forehead just comes impacting directly on you. And his eyes go cross and he says, are you the little girl we've been looking for? You betcha. I bet you can't catch me. And uh, 
he's going to start, he's going to misty step uh, 30 feet and just call out. Boop. <laughs> Perfect. So you misty step back that way. As you do so, you land beside Yildrum, who I'm as like as an old man is like breathing and wheezing and trying to keep up through the forest. And unbeknownst to you, coming out of the trees in front of the two rooks is the sloth with the boot on. And they look up and they see the sloth and he says, That's my boot! And he begins to swing the mace at you. Uh do you do anything before he does this? Well, I'm I'm high up in the trees, as high as I could yep. go. He's trying to basically smash a tree down to get to you. I I move over to another tree and say, I will, I, I will oh, remind you, you are yeah. a sloth. <laughs> <laughs> you muted yourself, Mikey's. Make me a dexterity saving throw because you have polymorphed into a sloth. Eh? So what dex does she have I, as a, a sloth? <laughs> I'm going to say it's just going to be just your proficiency bonus straight up. Hmm? Oh, wow, did dex? Nice. Yeah, it's just zero decks. Other than that, it would have been a very agile sloth. Like, <laughs> like a negative five or something like that. Not 20. Not 20. <laughs> so 25. Perfect. The sloth, with some kind of arcane, eldritch, unknowable Cthulhu-esque grace, jumps <laughs> into another conical tree, right? As you enter the tree, the one that you were just on basically collapses and falls straight down. It lands on the rook, who throws it to the side. He looks up and he sees you and he says, get it, we need to get it. And then the other one with the flail walks up and they're going to start just destroying trees at random. Um, so this time make me another dexterity saving throw at disadvantage because how many trees are being broken. Oh, uh, I would like to use a key point to remove the dis disadvantage. Go ahead. Go ahead. The inner power of the monk sloth. Yeah, yes. the... Go into monk stands. Yeah. <laughs> the sloth stands. Right. Uh, dirty 20. Dirty 20? Perfect. So you make it to another tree, just barely. The trees are breaking around you. Um, both Finnick and Yildjum, right in front of you guys, trees just start falling all around you and breaking. You see the polymorph sloth that is your friend above you directly, and the will see you again, uh, Caroline Finnick. The statue of Caroline is still behind them, now left alone on the board. What do you guys want to do? Kind of look at look at Finnick and say, like, so what is the plan? Like so she's still on the board, again on the board. So they had her in them in their hand before, right? And then we're back to the board. Correct. I um I I say to Phoenix I she would should have been with us earlier I guess there's some sort of shenanigans going on making her not being able to leave the board perhaps eh? okay and so you hear this really deep voice coming from this little girl just all right here's what you're gonna do you need to find a way to get this spell off of Carolina. I'm going to try and split up the two. One can go after me, the other, and I'm sure that Ginny will keep the other busy. Hmm. I have a few tricks. Might take me an hour, though. I'm kind of move towards the chessboard. <laughs> 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 that's very, uh, that sucks for you. Um, perfect. So you move to the chessboard. And one of you goes north, one of you goes south. I'm going to say that Finnick is going south and you, Jenny, are going north. All right? Just for simplicity's sake. So what we're going to do is this. We're going to start with you, Yuljim. What is your plan to get Carolina out of this statue form? I mean, first of all, taking a look at the thing, the easiest way would be try to cast a spell magic on it and see if that works. I mean, that would be the cheap and easy and dirty way out. Um, but maybe, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. Perfect. So as you try to catch the spell magic, you realize at first it's not working. And um, I won't make you make an arcana check for this just because you're a high-level wizard. But you realize yeah. this is more something along the lines of a curse. And <laughs> only a properly removed curse, which you probably have, could remove this. Yeah, uh, in an hour I have. <laughs> I, I, I have I have the spell in the book, but I don't have it memorized. So that's the that's the problem. Um, I can learn it fairly quickly, but it takes me an hour to do so. Perfect. 
So uh, let me try other things first. <laughs> all right. So what are you going to do and try to get Carolina to safety? Get let give me a little bit. Um... All right. Perfect. So we move down to you then, Finnick. Um, you're moving in little girl form away from the rook with the flail. Um, he's chasing you, shouting for you to stop moving. He just wants to take you to the Pale King so the Pale King can drain you of all your blood and move on with his life and start collecting taxes once again, as kings are wont to do. Um, so what are you doing, Finnick? How are you trying to hide from this thing? Finnick is just running full tilt at this point. Um, but how far away is uh, this giant behind him? So while the rook itself is maybe 20 feet behind you, given its size and the length of this weapon, you're constantly having to dodge flail strikes that lash out towards you. So, um, Finnick as Carolina is going to call out as she's running. Um, so I have this story. As a child, a wicked magician always wanted to saw people in half. Now you might be asking, was he an only child? No, he had lots of half brothers and sisters. And I'm casting hideous laughter on the. Uh... <laughs> you weave your spell, fantastically executed. May I add, as the magic works its way into the stone mind of the rook. Something happens. Its body begins to shimmer and shake as if it's a heat mirage, and the blood on its body becomes more and more fresh. And then your mouth fills with blood, stopping your spell midway through the sentence, and you realize that this thing has somehow rebuked your magic pack upon you and just nullified your spell. It is immune to magic. <sighs> well, it was worth a try. And uh, he's just going to keep just charging through uh, the forest just as fast as he can, just uh, using his, you know, circus training to kind of jump um, over roots, kind of using the trees as as balances. Perfect. Make me a dexterity check with acrobatics. Put it into the side chat for me. And as the camera moves away from this little Carolina girl bleeding from her mouth, the camera looks back to the blood red sky above, and then it moves back down to a sloth who is also fleeing. Um, what did you try to do to get away from this mace wielding rook that's chasing you, sloth Finnick? I Sorry, uh, sloth Jenny. <laughs> Jenny. Yes. Uh, I'm doing my best to keep ahead and. Um, are there any uh, fruits in the trees? These are fruitless trees, but there are lots of pine cones, if that will suffice. All right. Uh, yeah, I, I throw pine cones down at them on occasion, and I say, Fuck you! It's my food now! Perfect. As you do so, you enrage this rook, and it's going to axe and surge, and pretty much lay waste to every tree in front of it. Um, please make me a dexterity saving throw. Again, with disadvantage, unless you want to spend your key point. You're muted. I, uh, I'm definitely using a key point. For, right. Well, it's actually two key points, but... All right. Uh, 17. 17, perfect. So you don't jump to another tree, but you are hidden inside of one of the trees that have fallen. The rook looks around angrily and begins smashing this everything he sees on the ground, somehow just glancing and missing over you, Jenny. Um, as this is happening, what's your plan of action to do now that you're kind of like stuck inside this tree? Not you, Yojin, Jenny. Jenny's like, oh shit. <laughs> so I'm compromised. <laughs> <laughs> I am uh, I'm thinking of sneaking up on him and crawling onto his head. Well, and trying the bad news. The bad news for you would be that you um at this point, probably because I'm doing stuff now and I need the concentration spell stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so the polymorph ends. So, yes. Oh, no, that's yes. fine. 
as so long you, as I'm not inside the tree. Perfect. So you're still under the tree. You begin to kind of shake and wobble, and then it's like the the sloth opens its mouth, and you come crawling out of its mouth, covered in nice, delicious sloth goo as the polymuff ends, and you leave behind your old skin. You're still hidden in the tree. Um, so you want to try and sneak up on the rook, correct? Uh, yes. Okay, it's going to be a stealth check at disadvantage because he's just kicking things up in the air. Um, uh, removing disadvantage. All right. <laughs> that killed Tony. Perfect, perfect, I love it. So you get over close to where the rook is. You look up and you're at one of his beautiful, lavish, amazing boots. And as you go to crawl up on top of it, we switch back to you, Yuljim. Yuljim, you're standing over the broken, not, not broken, but cracked pond of Carolina at your feet. She's <clears throat> whimpering and crying, scared for her life. What do you do? So I'll try to basically, I hope that the, the curse comes from the board and I can kind of cut the connection. And what I'll try to do is cast Otiluke's Resilient Sphere on her, which basically remove disallows any kind of spells going in or going out. And I don't know if that works. If that doesn't work, I have another plan, but uh, that sucks. You conjure <laughs> up your sphere, um, the sphere that she is inside of. If she had not yet been transformed, this would have worked perfectly. Unfortunately, she's already been transformed. It does not interrupt what's already happened to her because it's already happened to her. So Can you know, I... But then, to, can, so what you can do basically is a hamster ball, right? Yeah. Uh, can I kind of roll her off the board? Perfect. Yeah, you can definitely roll her off the board. <laughs> she won't change back, but you found a way to at least get her off the board. That's great. So roll her off the board and away for now. Just All right, which, I'm going to assume you're trying to head back towards where the river is, or you're trying to head further east. So sorry, west. So east or I'll, west, which way you want to I'll go? I'll try to head inside a. Okay, so here's what I do. I actually use my magic item. Mm -hmm. I'll I'm, like I, I unfold my portable hole and put her in the hole, and fold the the hole back and put her in my in my pocket. Perfect. <laughs> <And> I love <laughs> it. <laughs> and I'll just leave. And uh, yeah, well, give me some time. Maybe I come up with something else. Okay. So you stick Carolina and your sphere into your pocket. Ten out of ten idea. I love it. We move back to you, Finnick. Um, Finnick, with your dexterity check that you made early, with a solid dirty 30, um, you're moving around the destructive swing of this flail, um, confusing and making the work angry, yet somehow awe-inspired watching Carolina do this. But it's now, what do you want to do now, Carolina? Like, what's your plan from this point on? She knows that she needs, or he knows that he needs to shake this, this, uh, this drawing from, uh, getting him so uh he is going to attempt using the these thick woods uh to lose his attacker just by weaving and dodging um trying to find any sort of hills or or anything like that to lose right. him um i'm going to say instead of stealth i'm going to say make a deception check for me because it sounds kind of like destroying like basically the environment mm -hmm. it's very hard to hide but easy to trick it if you're trying to do one of those okay i'm using my inspiration <laughs> dope <laughs> uh that is a 17. perfect um you just barely make it so you basically you duck under this tree then you jump over this tree and it's trying to follow your movements and it just can't. And pretty soon you've lost it and it keeps moving in one direction, leaving you basically just left there as it goes by you. Uh, do you wanna head back to the chessboard now or what? Yeah, uh, he's going to kind of come back around and uh, yeah. So as the bloody mouth Carolina moves back to the chessboard, we switch back to you, uh, Jenny. So Jenny, you're just now basically climbing up the back of this thing who's destroying everything around it. It's none the wiser. What do you want to do? I climb onto the top of his head and I see, you know, I think it went that way. And I point in a northerly direction and what I'm going to technically be doing the dodge action, but I'm mm -hmm. going to try and get himself to hit himself on the head. Perfect. So let me make an attack roll with that. What's your AC yet? 
18. 18. Wowzers. Okay. So, oh, I have disadvantage. And, yes. Yeah. Perfect. All right. So that disadvantage actually, it helped a lot because it went, it, before it was going to crit you, this time it missed under one. So it brings the hammer up, just smash whatever it's trying to speak into its ear. You know that rooks and most other chess pieces don't like it when things are talking inside of their head. So violently it smashes itself in the skull. You dodge and it does so again and you keep dodging and eventually it falls to the ground having broken open its scroll and leader after leader after leader after leader of salt water comes pouring out of the rook's skull as it lies there. What do you do now? I take a big drink, toasting myself, and then I start running back towards the chessboard. I like it. So you three reconvene. Finnick and um, Jenny, you guys get back to the chessboard. And you see that Yildrim is there, but Carolina is not. What happens next? Where did she go? I got the other one. So I would be invisible, actually. <laughs> oh, so it's just an empty chessboard. Jenny would scratch her head. <clears throat> so if I see her, I would go up to her and... Um... Um, so here's here's a question. So because depending on how you answer this, this might solve a few issues for us or not. So are the portable hole has a problem with extra dimensional uh, extra uh, so extra dimensional spaces. So they can't combine. That kind of basically makes don't cross the streams, right? Yeah. Um, would be a demi plane be an extra extra dimensional space because there are different names so you're not there. you're not in a demi plane right now you can tell by the red sky you're back in the normal cross but i'm a high level mage if you were to jump into a demi plane i would be like and eh, you know what i'll let it pass okay because the, i would know the interaction between those two things right that's why yeah I exactly um okay so with her with her being there saying like um well I probably can get us out of here, but where is uh, where's Finnick? I don't know. You would just hear this crashing, and a Carolina that is rather tall comes out with like blood just like dripping from her mouth. I did you get it? I lost. I lost him back that away in the forest to. He'll turn around, but hopefully he's stupid enough not to do it for a while. Would you I... guys want to leave? Where's Carolina? He's fine. A little bit cracked in the face, but otherwise she looks... Well... She's still a chess piece. Yes, for now. Well, as, as long as you have her, yeah, let's, let's get out of here. All right. Uh, I rigor so well. Actually, uh, magic man, can you make her small to fit her in your pocket? Otherwise, I can carry her. I have a name, you know. I'm not magic man. I'm not uh, the wizard. I am Yildrim, the wise Yildrim, who tells the future. Yildrim, who makes you forget the past. I imagine you say all that, and then like the forest and everything else is like dead silent, right? <laughs> like just, just yeah, perfectly like, silent. Just like a cricket, just like yeah. a, cricket. a cricket is actually like making like an applause sound with its <laughs> and everything. Uh, Jenny uh, just smiles and holds up her drink. This helps me forget everything too. And uh -huh. I don't know, I you never told me your name, so I just call you Magic Land. Like everyone else does. Everyone else calls me drunky. Yes, of course. Well, how about we leave before they or anyone else comes? And I start to cast a spell. It's actually my highest level spell slot. <laughs> so what I meant, so basically what happens is like a, a doorway uh, kind of frame kind of um, happens or kind of gets created and from the situation where we're in there's a lot of debris from the broken kind of granite and uh, pieces i think um those would start to kind of coalesce into the into the doorway and into the door so basically these 
these the, this debris is kind of building themselves up into the into the form of a of the doorway first and then filling basically the innards of it forming this kind of um door door in in the door frame and one of one knows is kind of is the hook for the or the, the the um the handle for the door and i kind of cast the stone this is i checked it's, it's just this an action so it's just like this right um and i kind of open it and open it up and what you see, would see behind this if it works in this place i don't know murky is if it does what spell is it uh it's demi plane yeah it's fine it works all right, so open it up. You would see behind it, you would see um, a dark sky as we would be accustomed to in the nights without the the, sun, the, the, um, the starlights and such. But in the middle would be um, would be a pyre, which is a flame. And the it's like, it's, um, it's basically a circle you look into and the edges of the circle are framed by these wagons, basically building a wagon wheel. And we would seemingly enter inside to this to this circle from one of the wagons which opened the door of one of these one of the um the outside wagons that built basically the the barrier perfect so you guys enter into the demi plane some time passes and i imagine through some magical spell or trick by finnick or drunken enlightened mistake that works out by jenny you guys get back to the orb town and you eventually are able to, after a time, or maybe after an hour, maybe even instantly, break the curse on Carolina. Skipping forward a few days, not a few weeks, not a few months, not a few years, a few days, Carolina is once again lost. But that is a tale for another time. That being said, the camera shifts. We're in these trees, these perfectly comical trees. We see the sloth with that amazing boot that he's wearing right he's moved maybe 20 feet in all this time since the original encounter his camera centers on his face this zooms in slightly and he looks at the camera and he says to anyone watching fuck you for talking about the boots and that's how it ends our red and pleasant fairy tale um thank you for the watches we did have for this game Thank you for my friends who will end up watching this game as it's now uploaded to my channel. And I hope everyone has a good night, and I'll catch you guys on the next game.